This is a Tibet House member video and is a part of the ongoing Force for Good class series. To learn more about this ongoing series, please visit tibethouse.us. Oh, I see a new face. Do I see new faces? Anybody who was not here before? Yes? First time? First time? Oh, wow. You only come for the Kala Chakra, huh? <laughs> no. My girlfriend is coming soon. She is in the... I see, I see. I'm just kidding. Okay, that's good. So, uh, anyway, we're talking about Kala Chakra today, but, but uh, there's no difference in Sutra and Tantra between the emptiness issue. So this is the foundation of the Kala Chakra, Heart Sutra. So, okay, everyone ready? Ready to go? In Sanskrit, Bhagavati, Padna Paramita Susurdaya, in Tibetan, Chomden Dema Shera Pachin Yingbo, in English, Blessed Lady Buddha, Transcendent Wisdom Heart, thus did I hear on a special occasion, the Blessed Lord was dwelling on the vulture peak at Rajagurha, together with great communities of mendicants and bodhisattvas. At that time, the Blessed Lord entranced himself in the teaching samadhi called the Illumination of the Profound. Just then, the noble bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the great hero, was contemplating the practice of the profound transcendence of wisdom, and he realized that those five body-mind processes are void of any intrinsic reality. Thereupon, impelled by the power of the Buddha, Venerable Shariputra addressed the noble Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the great hero, thus, when any noble son wishes to engage in the practice of the profound transcendence of wisdom, how should he learn? Then the noble Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the great hero, addressed Venerable Sharidati Putri, thus, Sariputra, when any noble son or noble daughter wishes to engage in the practice of the profound transcendence of wisdom, he or she should realize it in this way. Those five body-mind processes should be truly realized to be void of any intrinsic reality. Matter is voidness, voidness is matter, voidness is not other than matter, neither is matter other than voidness. Likewise, sensations, conceptions, mental functions and consciousnesses are also void. Shariputra, thus all things are voidness, signless, uncreated, unceased, stainless, unpeckable, undecreased and unincreased. Shariputra, thus in voidness there are no matter, no sensation, no conception, no mental function, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no, no, no tongue, no body, no mentality, no form or color, no sound, no scent, no taste, no texture, no idea. There are no sense media from eye to mentality sense media, and there are no consciousness media from visual to mental consciousness media either. There are no ignorance and no cessation of ignorance and so on, up to no old age and death and no cessation of old age and death either. Likewise, there are no suffering, no origination, no cessation, no path, no intuitive wisdom, no attainment, and no non-attainment either. Therefore, Shariputra, because the Bodhisattva is without attainment, she lives in reliance on transcendent wisdom. His spirit is unobscured and free of fear. Passing far beyond all confusion, she ultimately succeeds in nirvana. And all the Buddhas who live in past, present, and future rely on transcendent wisdom to reach manifestly perfect Buddhahood in unexcelled perfect enlightenment. Such being so, there is the mantra of transcendent wisdom, the mantra of great science, the unexcelled mantra, the uniquely universal mantra, the mantra that eradicates all suffering. It is not false and should be known as truth. The transcendent wisdom mantra as follows, Tadyata, Om Gate Gate Para Gate Para Sam Gate Bodhiswaha, Om Gate Gate Para Gate Para Sam Gate Bodhiswaha, Om Gate Gate Para Gate Para Sam Gate Bodhiswaha. Chariputra, thus should the Bodhisattva, the great hero, learn the profound transcendence of wisdom. Thereupon the Blessed Lord arose from that samadhi and applauded the noble Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the great hero. Excellent, excellent, noble son, so it is, so it is. 
One should practice the profound transcendence of wisdom in just the way you have taught it, and even the transcendent Buddhas will joyfully congratulate you. When the Blessed Lord had spoken thus, the Venerable Shara, Dhatiputra, the Noble Bodhisattva, Avalokiteshvara, the great hero, and everyone in that audience, and the whole world with its gods, humans, titans, and fairies rejoiced, and all applauded what the Buddha said. <laughs> Very good. Thank you very much. Okay. So now we are on the Kala Chakra. We talked a little bit about... Uh, hello over there. Yeah, the uh, uh, we talked a little bit about the Kriya Samaja, the main unexcelled yoga tantra, father tantra. We talked a little bit about the Chakra Sambara, the main mother tantra. Then the Kala Chakra Tantra is in the subcategory of the Mother Tantra. Uh, but it is, its one uniqueness is that it's said to be the explicit Tantra, the Shinto Salve Yu, the very clear Tantra. Whereas the other Unexcelled Yoga Tantras, they kind of hide something back. Like in the Kriya Samaja Tantra, Chandra Kirti, in his famous commentary on it called The Illuminating Lamp, he has a beautiful thing where he says, that first of all, in the root tantras, what are called the Vajra words of the root, hello William, how are you? What are called the Vajra words of the root tantra, things are scrambled where you can't really understand them automatically what they really mean in the root tantra. I mean, they claim, clearly say that. So then second, there were the, one of the things that makes the Guya Samaja special is that there were five what are called explanatory tantras or vyakya tantras, which were also taught by Buddha in commentary on his own root tantra. So he taught a root tantra with vajra words, then vajra word explanatory tantra, but with, in which things are still scattered around. So they're not all like in one place in, the, in that. And then the uh, uh, different commentaries, they sort of sort them out and, but then finally, you have to have the direct precept of a guru, of a lama, uh, to sort of give you how to fit them all together. So there's like three or four stages of obscurity in the time. Hermeneutic that Chandrakirti explains, which are called the seven ornament system of, hermeneutic means theory of interpretation of tantras, there's a, which comes from India, not from Tibet. So there are some scholars who think that the Tibetans made sort of Tantra obscure because they were all monks and that Tantra is really a big sexy thing and really, really weird, crazy stuff. And so the Tibetans wanted to still be good monks, so they made it all kind of like obscured, which is totally false. The Chandrakirti wrote in the seventh century in India this, uh, this changeover thing, you know, and uh, this complicated interpretational thing. And in that, Whereas in the exoteric system, the most direct explanation, let's say, of emptiness, rather than some hinted roundabout way of talking, of coming up with emptiness, is considered superior type of teaching, what they call definitive meaning teaching versus interpretable meaning teaching. But in Tantra, or then there's sometimes they call it intentional teaching, uh, teaching with ulterior intention or explicit teaching. So the one with ulterior attention is like the interpretable one, the lower one, in the exoteric system. But in the esoteric system, the one that is more obscure is the higher one. Whenever you explain it plainly to someone, that's a, like a lesser level that you're talking about. The ultimate level, you, have, you want to disguise what you're saying. You do it by hinting and so forth. So, I mean, they don't really say why so, but I say so the student has to figure it out themselves. And they have a feeling that it's more internalized there, the way they do it. And of course, that's because Tantra takes people to this level where they're encountering the fear of death, the fear of melting, the fear of dissolution. And when you do that, then you have to decide that you figure that out yourself. <laughs> and you want to do that, and you're ready to do that. You can't be feeling some authority is pushing you. Or you'll, you know, you'll recoil and you'll shrink up and freak out, you know. I, I mean, that's my way of explaining it anyway. I might be wrong, but I think that's the case. It's like when, in, you know, in the famous stories of Tilopa and Naropa, who are two of the most important in Guya Samaja, in Chakrasambhara, and most of the Tantras, 
Um, you know, there are these 12 ordeals that Naropa had to undergo in his discipleship with Tilopa. And Tilopa would do things like, he would say, oh, look at the queen on that elephant. She really has so many beautiful gems she's wearing. If I had a real disciple, he would go and just take those jewels and bring them to me so I can give them to my girlfriend. Too bad I don't have any real, real disciple. So then Narapa, of course, runs over and attacks the elephant and tries to get the queen's jewels. And then the bodyguards of the queen beat him nearly to death. And then, and then the Tilopa comes up to him and says, Narapa, what, what are you, crazy? Why are you trying to steal the jewels from the queen? Who, like, what, what's, the, what's the matter with you, you know? And then he goes like this, and then he's totally healed. So there are these 12 times he did things like that. Oh, if I had a cycle, he would jump off the cliff here. <laughs> and Narapa jumps off. But then he heals him, you know. Uh, Dilopa does. <clears throat> and so they're a kind of symbol of the fact that to build a divine nervous system, you know, an open chakra, Kala chakra, chakra sambara, Guya samaja, whatever, Vajra Yogini, He Vajra, your nervous system, in order to do that, you kind of have to shatter your attachment to yourself as an ordinary, and having an ordinary nervous system, you know, I think is what they mean. Although maybe he was a hard case and he really did have to go to undergo all these medical <laughs> triage things. So the Dalai Lama, by the way, he says, so therefore when you're a teacher and around in Tantra, you have to be very cautious. He says, especially I do, with all these hippies around here in Dharamsala. <laughs> he said, he said hey, if I said the real disciple would jump off the terrace here, some of them might jump off, he said. And he said, not only do I not have the ability to heal them just by passing my hand over them like Dilipa did, he said, but here at Dharamsala, we don't even have ambulance service. <laughs> That's a great sense of humor. <laughs> anyway, anyway, <clears throat> so, so Kala Chakra is supposed to be its special virtue, an amazing thing about it, is that it, uh, it, uh, it's the most explicit type of thing. And there are some very explicit things in the Kala Chakra. And in a way, the inner, you know, the, if, look, if you look at this, uh, this uh, mandala, there are three buildings, in, so one inside another in the, in the mandala, which is also quite unusual. You know, the, the general circle is the other kind, the new kind of cosmos, you know, that you create. And then inside that is the mandala palace of the, of the Buddha. But it's a whole Buddha community with 722 members this community has. And when you are visualizing yourself as Kala Chakra, if you become initiated and you're practicing it, then you also are all the other deities in the thing. So in a way, so this kind of complicated mandala is like a rehearsal for the Buddha consciousness, which remember I have said endlessly and tiresomely in this course, in the, in the classes I have done about how the nature of the Buddha is, of a Buddha, when you're a Buddha, you will have a big shock because you won't just be looking out of your own face like a regular person, but somehow expanded into a Buddha. You'll be looking out of everybody's face simultaneously. So Buddha could be confused if he or she became confused in the sense that, which one am I? Wait a minute, oh yeah, oh knock. Oh yeah, I'm Buddha over here. So it's a weird thing where you're simultaneously many people. You have the experience of yourself as simultaneously being many people. So, uh, so in the Kala Chakra Mandala, you are all the people in the Mandala. But a lot of them, there are a lot of gods in the Mandala also. All the gods are there. All the Hindu gods. Brahma. I'm sure Yahweh is there too somewhere. He just doesn't know it. But he must be there. But they're all there. Shiva, Vishnu. And more important, what is fun about Kala Chakra is that all the Mrs. gods are there. Mrs. Brahma, Mrs. Shiva, Mrs. Vishnu, Mrs. Indra. They're all there. And in the speech mandala, which is the middle building, on the eight lotuses in the speech mandala, which I don't, I don't really have, but I should have more slides with close-ups from this kind of a powder mandala. But, but anyway, there's eight lotuses inside that second building in the kind of courtyard. It would look like a courtyard from above, but it's actually a building. And there's eight lotuses in it. And those eight lotuses, each one of them has eight petals. And there are 64 speech goddesses, which are all the Vedic like, you know, Savitri and Gayatri and all those kind of goddesses which are Vedic 
speech goddesses are all in there to please those, you know, those former Brahmins and people who are the original disciples of the Kal Chakra. And um, they're all in there. I don't know, this thing is migrating. It doesn't like my hearing aids or something, or my ears or two, whatever. You have to have a shelf on your ear when you start having a lot of spare parts. And um, I need a bureau up there to all of the things. And, uh, and in the center of those are all the Mrs. Gods, you know, Mrs. Mrs. Rudra, you know, they're all there. And then the male gods, so there are two, of the 722 people, there's two forms of a lot of the deities in the Kala Chakra. And in the speech mandala, the females are the big strong ones. You know, the, you know in, the, in those yabyums, you know, you usually have like the big male and then the female is kind of wrapped around the male, you know. But in the speech mandala, the female is the big one, the big sort of strong one. And the male is wrapped around her waist. You know, there's this little male. And my friend, who late friend, who was the Dalai Lama, is one of his favorite artists. He was very upset with the monk artists at Namgyal Monastery, Dalai Lama's monastery. Because when they drew each of these deities independently in a panoply that he designed for them to draw, they kept putting breasts on the male consort, the small male consorts. And they made the female big ones in the speech mandala flat chested, you know, because they couldn't understand a big female and a little male. He was very mad. He had them repaint them all, you know. But I thought that was really cool. It's kind of a little tease in there. They're teasing the male chauvinist gods, you know. You know, they didn't get into the. There's no bathroom in the mandala, so they didn't have to get into that. <laughs> Sorry. No, I hope no, anybody's from North Carolina. <laughs> so, okay. So, uh, so then, the, and then in the body mandala, there's twelve. Month, the 12 month lotuses on the backs of different kind of animals. You can sort of see them in the white band there in the outer building. And there in the center there are the same couples, but the male is the dominant one in that one, you know, in the body mandala, you know. So body, speech the female, body the male. And then in the central one is the mind mandala. And there are their male and female Buddhas. And it's sort of like the Guya Samaja mandala, but the deities are different. And actually, I'm sorry, I put this this slide in the wrong way. The black should be down because the down is the front because the east is the down always in mandalas. I didn't notice that because I photographed it with my iPhone from somewhere and then I, I didn't turn it. <coughs> so <coughs> this is not the way it should be. I mean, it's good in all directions, but the front of the deity is facing this way. And this is very unusual with the, it's unique in the Kaltaka mandala where the Amoga Siddhi Buddha is in the eastern door. He's in, he's in black colored, and he's in the eastern door, corresponding to the black face of Kalachaka, which is his front eastern face. And the wisdom of Amoga Siddhi is the, is the, is the wonder-working wisdom, or the all-accomplishing wisdom, and, uh, which is the transmutation of the, of the energy of envy, of the afflictive, anguishing energy of envy. And... Um, but the all accomplishing means it's sort of active and the Kala Chakra has this special connection to planetary history. Some of you know Tayar de Chardin. I know you have, I think some of you must know Tayar de Chardin. And Tayar de Chardin was a Catholic visionary and he talked about the Omega point, you know, in history and there would be a time when God had prepared and there would be like heaven on earth. The New it was his version of the New Jerusalem. Shambhala has an idea like that even though there's no omnipotent creator. But the Shakyamuni Buddha shaped things by the, and the Kala Chakra is what really most graphically illustrates what Shakyamuni Buddha shaped, how he shaped the history of the planet. And so that 400 years from now, there'll be a golden age, which then they say just as a concession, I think, to the depressed people who want to have a dark age, um, they said after that, they will go back to Kali Yuga, to an age of decay before it reaches a nadir sort of point, and then it comes up, and then Maitreya comes many hundreds, many thousands of years later. Nobody really knows exactly how long. But there'll be 800 years of a golden age, that's the age of Shambhala. That's, so, there's, so it reinforces the idea that is normally avoided in Buddhist concepts of history, 
because they want people to sort of get out of being concerned about creating a historical future. They want to get them internally to create their own future and create their own Buddha land. And they don't want to be thinking about, you know, political revolutions. They don't want them to in the old days. So they left the cosmology the way the Brahmins had it, which is a decay cosmology, which conservatives always have a decay cosmology. The conservatives always think the next generation is going to be more stupid and worse off than them. So that's why they're nasty to them. And they want to keep everything like the old days. You know what I mean? Type of, that's the conservative thing. But actually, in the Buddha land idea of the Shakyamuni and in Buddhism, and especially in the Kala Chakra, there's a positive development on the planet. You know, And therefore, they put the all wonder-working Buddha in the east, usually he's in the northern door in Guya Samadja Chakra Sambara. Amoga City is always in the north. And, uh, and the eastern one is peaceful, Vairochana, you know, usually. And, uh, but not in, the, not in this uh, Kala Chakra. And uh, then the, the yellow one, uh, Vairochana is in the west, and he's yellow. So. And I'll, I'll maybe go through that thing a little bit later. But let me come back and remind you a few things about Tantra, what it's all about. Um, uh, Tantra, just to remind you, right? The three principles of the path, which you have all, which you all know, we've told a lot about in the previous sessions, and the Geishi, who was here, the Kembo, who the abbot who was here, taught you about Shanti Deva's way of creating the spirit of enlightenment of the Bodhisattva mind of love and compassion, which is the second principle of the path. First one is the transcendent renunciation, which has to, go, has to be developed through mindfulness, through recognizing that the passions, you know, the, those kind of uncontrollable emotions coming out of the unconscious that control us, which we can't control if we're ordinary people, although a Buddha does control. And when we become more enlightened, the more we are enlightened, the more we can control them. But we can't control them as unenlightened. But some level of detachment from them, some level of transcending them, some resolution to drop out from them is very really critical first principle. And that's a central prerequisite for Tantra because Tantra, you're getting where you're working around in the unconscious stew of energies with your archetype deities and all of that. Tantra is a, is a way of mining the unconscious, but you have to have a level of detachment from it to be able to do that. So that's essential. Then the love and compassion is very, very essential so that as you begin to unearth the powers of your own mind and psyche and unconscious, they, that, those powers will not be able to sweep you away into some power trip, but you will remember that your goal is to become enlightened for the sake of all beings, that all beings are your mother. You will refrain from any harm for anyone, and so on and so on. So that's essential. And then finally, the wisdom. Without the wisdom, you can't create the alternative universe. You, you know, because you can't realize they, that the universe, what wisdom makes you realize is not that the universe is not there. Emptiness does not mean nothingness. Emptiness means infinite potential, infinite relativity. Infinite relativity means that everything is totally mutable and transformable. So therefore, all your sort of absolutizing energy is dedicated to transforming the relative. And, and, and you realize that the relative is totally shapeable. The emptiness lets you realize that. And it frees your imagination to take up the responsibility of shaping it in the, up, in the best of all, into the best of all possible worlds, which is what Voltaire ridiculed, remember? Voltaire ridiculed that there was such a thing. And uh, monotheists, you know, omnipotent monotheists, people who rebel against omnipotent monotheism do, do the same thing. Because if you claim that there is a power that has absolute and is omnipotent, then there's no, there is no excuse for not creating everything perfect to start with. The statement that, well, he wants people to learn for themselves so they'll feel godlike as they learn it for themselves, doesn't work because they would, he could create them as having the fruit of feeling like they worked for themselves if he's omnipotent, or she, or she, or she, or it, or whatever it is. So therefore, that becomes, the, you have to have blind, non-rational faith in that, like materialists have blind, non-rational faith that they won't exist when they die, so therefore they already got ready-made opioid nirvana. <laughs> so therefore they'll never make a big effort to change, their, change themselves. They, 
that they have a circuit breaker in there and try to make a big self-transforming effort. It goes click at some point and they lose their power. So, but, but the, the person who knows absolute relativity by knowing emptiness, that relativity itself is the absolute, that's the person who then puts their, that ultimate energy absolute used just in an emphatic way, their absolute energy, like their complete focus and concern on transforming the relative into the mandala of Kala Chakra. And that's one way that the, uh, so, that's, that, so, that, so those three prerequisites are really what it's all about. And therefore, you know, you can't, even though they say in Tantra, in unexcelled Yoga Tantra, you could ta attain enlightenment in a single lifetime. You could attain millions of lifetimes worth of evolution in one lifetime by compressing time in a certain super high-speed way. Uh, you can do that, even though they say that. That's meaningless unless you already feel you're stuck in an infinite field of time. In other words, the compression of this vast time is, doesn't mean anything if you just think that you're only here in this one life. So not only the sutra system, not only the Theravada and the Nirvana does it require for one to be successful in it, that one has a feeling of the moment as being something that contains all of the universe in it. And all of the, and the universe is not just a spatial thing, it's a temporal thing. So it contains not only all of the spatial universe, but all of the temporal universe, that is eternity as well as infinity. It's not a moment for a material, like a moment for a materialist where it's a, it's sort of, it's an escapist rehearsal of that non-existent deep sleep uh, analogy unconsciousness that they expect, that they fantasize, that they imagine is the deep reality that will embrace them upon dying. Do you follow me? That's, which is the unrealistic fantasy of the materialist. And it's unrealistic, just like monotheistic deity is unrealistic because there can never be evidence for such a thing. There, will, there, there is no evidence for it. Whoever found that somebody became nothing. They can't, they can't even find nothing itself, much less somebody in the nothing. <laughs> All they do is they don't find a consciousness in a dead body. Great. That doesn't mean they found a nothingness in the dead body even. This means they didn't find the pulses that they found there when the heart was beating. And the brain was like showing like electro, electrical Although the brain's energy is not just handling electricity. The electrical is just like a little thing. It's like if you put an EEG electrodes on top of a big sewer pipe and it detects all kinds of pulsation inside what's the pipe. It doesn't mean that there's only electricity in the sewer pipe. There's <laughs> a lot of other crap in there. <laughs> which, which, the, which the electrodes are not aiming to get. You know? So our brains are not just dealing with electricity. They're dealing with the much more powerful thing in the energies of the universe, the brain. Really. Strong force, weak force, gravity. It's all, the brain deals with all of it. Not that well. When your mind is out of your brain, it functions better, according to the Book of the Dead, but I've already told you that, right? The minute you die, you're nine times more intelligent. So it would really be great, you could get a Nobel Prize or anything if you could somehow keep working in your lab after you were dead. <laughs> but nobody knows how to do that. Oh, I feel so healthy. So, uh, okay, so those two things are necessary. Then they get into Tantra. Then, they all, then, they're, then there are the action Tantra, which are rituals, where you shape your self in a certain way. Then there are performance tantras where there's ritual and also internal visionary thing. Then there's yoga tantra, which is more internal. And those three are very more lengthy. They take a lot more lifetimes. Uh, they're more calm and peaceful. And uh, that's, you know, a more gradual way of getting down toward the unconscious and beginning to, but they all have visualization and so forth. And then you get the unexcelled yoga tantra. Then unexcelled yoga tantras have creation stage and perfection stage, or perfection or completion. A lot of people, books you will read, they call it development stage. And I'm sorry, but anybody who calls it the development stage doesn't know what it is. 
because there's a word for development, and it is not the word utpati, or keba in Tibetan. Keba and utpati means to create something, to give birth to it. It doesn't mean to develop it. There's a word ripening, you know, develop, which is in the, in the level area of ripening. And you will see this. If you see the video I got put you you here, just to give you a clue, this one will show. Uh, now, wait, OK. OK. I, I never put a video in a PowerPoint before. You guys are really. Now, do you, now you think nothing is that. Wait, what is this? It's the Big Bang. Watch. This isn't a different mandala, but it gives you the idea. It doesn't matter. There it goes. Then, wait a minute. Ah, that's wind, which means energy, pure energy. Then rum, you, there was a yam under that, you didn't see it, but there's rum, then that's fire. That's heat. Then vum, and that is, Tibetans uh, mix up B and V, that's water. Then lam, that's earth. And they are four, actually, they are actually four goddesses, four buddhises. Then on top, that's earth. It's a square golden thing. Then on top of that is a Vajra cross. And then a hum on top of that, a blazing hum. And then the hum creates, this is like, it, it, they did it outside. It should be around embracing all that, but it's a little something. But it gives the idea. Then here is the... Here is the, um, these are the eight cemeteries, which are the samsara, actually, the ordinary world. They're eight shmashanas, or charnel grounds, is that what they're called. Then you have this field of energy inside, then the Vajra cross, then, uh, which is the way, another way of combining four elements, then the thing, then brum, 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 the sound of creation. Then brum, from brum, it's more complicated, but it does it quickly, the Mandala Palace. But this is a different universe, therefore, that means. Now, inside the Mandala Palace, then there are some deities who are going to pop up there. The, actually, these, this mandala, the, the Kalachakra Mandala, is inside this mandala, actually. These guys are the foundation. The, these guys are creating the foundation inside which? Inside the Amaravati Stupa in South India in which then the Buddha first created in this era, the Kalachakra Mandala. And never mind, we'll stop this now. You don't need these guys. This is, yeah, this is Yamantaka, the killer of death. Or in, uh, in post-Arnold post uh, world, in post-Arnold world, the Terminator Exterminator. <laughs> Series 8 Terminator who gets rid of the earlier series. <laughs> Death being the Terminator, right? And then the, extermin the exterminator of the Terminator, that's what Yamantika means. It's a really brilliant, beautiful vision of Buddhahood, of infinite life Buddhahood, as the death of death. Because once death, is di death, death dies, then even death can die. Then death works for life, you know? In fact, it's a beautiful idea, really it is. I really like it. Yamantaka. She really likes the Amantika. I'm just kidding. Looking really serious, isn't it? Look at that. Okay. So, <laughs> so I do too. So, um, so then, uh, so well, well, that's why it should be called creation stage, because every. Uh, creation stage, sadhana, which means somehow accomplishment or, you know, means of accomplishment or performance, I like to call it, or script for performance, performance script, but really it's a performance, um, uh, involves, begins out of the void, and it's very important that the void be like a, a, a realm filled with energy like that flash of light that you saw. It's the clear light of the void. It's, it's the void with all those stars in it, which indicate the presence of the clear light. It's a vast space with stars in it. It's not a dark, blank space, a, a fantasy of something, what nothingness might be like. 
because actually nothingness is not a space, right? It's nothing. So that's considered very, very important that when in the beginning of a tantric sadhana, when it goes, may all become voidness, or may all be voidness, you know, shunyata bhavatu, it means tombanya uh, dur in Tibetan, you know. It means that uh, everything is, becomes transparent in its pure potential state, pure malleable, mutable state to be shaped. So it is no, there is no nothingness, so it is not a going into nothingness. There's a feeling of the ordinary world that was there sort of seeming solid, solidly around you and you as an ordinary being within it disappearing, but not disappearing into a blank state of nothingness, disappearing into a clear light of the void, into a diamond-like realm of infinite energy. That's what's, and then, it, then the sadhana is where the imagination creates a new universe. I'll never forget that all I'm a senior teacher in a very important initiation I was fortunate to receive many years ago. He, I, I was, it's one of those kind of things in the middle of a, he spoke, used to speak really, really quickly in Tibetan. And, you know, like, like that. He talked like that, like a New Yorker in, on Tibetan. And uh, very, very quick speech. But the one thing he kept repeating, he said, if anybody tells you that this mandala is in this place or that place in the world, they don't know what they're talking about. Because the, these mandalas are not in the world somewhere. They are another world. And for example, that's where the Kala Chakra is more explicit. Because in Kala Chakra, you have the outer Kala Chakra, you have the inner Kala Chakra, and you have what's called the alternative Kala Chakra. And the alternative or the other Kala Chakra, outer, inner, and other. So the other Kala Chakra means the other universe. But all of the Anaxal Yoga Tantra mandalas, all are a different universe. So they're not in anywhere, but the doorway to them is in every atom, everywhere. In other words, whoever, wherever you open that doorway, because you know about it, you're initiated, you enter that tradition, and you have, you have that kind of powerful imagination which you have empowered. And it's not that you have that from birth, necessarily, or because you're a great artist, or you're Picasso or something, or you're a great yogi. You have it because you have steeped your mind deeply in the subtleties of the royal reason of relativity, that there is no non-relative core in anything. Everything is empty and devoid of any non-relative core. And you're so steeped in that, that you're aware that everything is pure relational. So therefore, you're completely self-correcting at all times. When you see that chair as if it is a massive fact, as if it possesses the massive facticity of the chair, the intrinsic referentiality of the term chair, the thing in itself of chairness, etc. However, you d different old naive metaphysicians, east and west, have projected into that chair. When you see it as without that, you see through the chair, and then you realize that. Then you then it then it becomes transparent, and that and it's just a kind of temporary formulation of of. Um, of, uh, of infinite energy, actually. And you might relate to it as a chair if you want, but you'll never fasten on it as, as a chair in itself. And you won't fasten on yourself as a thing in itself, as a you in yourself, which doesn't mean that you won't exist. It means that you become capable of feeling you are a Buddha. Or you can develop what's called the Buddha confidence or the Buddha pride or the Buddha stability. Instead of your ordinary mind of like, oh, either narcissistic, I think I'm omnipotent, but I know I'm not, so I'm scared, witless, and very pride and, scared and paranoid. Or whatever our normal sort of level of anxiety that we normally live with and tolerate, waiting to be stepped on or worried or whatever. You know how we are. We're all like that, right? Especially when we feel a little good, then we're waiting to get spanked. <laughs> or arrested in this culture. So, uh, oh yeah, that's a different thing, but I'm not talking about that right now. So, um, so may all things be void, that's what it is, you know. Now, Kala Chakra, especially, I love it because Kala Chakra is the most graphic, explicit affirmation of the Buddha's continuing presence with us all. It's right there in every name of Buddha, even in, it's not emphasized in Theravada 
or Mahasangika, the different versions of the dualistic Buddhism, you know, the Nirvana and Samsara are part type of Buddhism. It's not there much because they want to think that when Buddha went off into Parinirvana, he left. He went into a different place where, they, where the world is not. And they were only translated in modern times Parinirvana as final Nirvana, where it should only be translated as thorough or total Nirvana. That's what it should be translated as. And so actually Nirvana swallowed samsara, actually, when the Buddha leaves his body. His, he swallowed samsara. But he doesn't leave it. But in the Mahayana, it's totally there in the name of Buddha called Triadvanya, which means the knower of three times, the awareness in three times, the, the knowingness within three times, the intuition of three times. Meaning, one way you can tell whether you're a Buddha or not is if you think you're in the moment, you're not Buddha. <laughs> Unless that moment includes every single infinite past moment, that you are ever in, and every conceivable possible future moment that you can be in, and not only yourself, but everyone else with you. So Triadvanya means present in all three times. So that is why Buddha, although to us it seems like he attained nirvana and broke his bodhisattva vow, he became a Buddha and left us whatever. What, was, what were you when Buddha was, it became Buddha under the Bodhi tree 2,500 years ago? Actually, you might have been a mouse. The reason that the mouse is the first animal in the 12 animal cycle of the Tibetan and Chinese calendar is that mice are smart. They know where a little jewel is or a little piece of cheese or something. So they, oh, there's some guy teaching the Dharma. That's going to be really good. So the first animal to come to the Buddha's teaching was a, was a mouse, a field mouse, you know. The mouse came running up. Oh, what, what's he teaching? Unfortunately, and even, actually, no, a mouse could understand the, the Dharma from Buddha, because Buddha would be heard by a mouse in mouse language. That's part of being a Buddha. Buddha because Buddha would be present in mouse consciousness, and mouse would perceive the Four Noble Truths as no cheese, cause of no cheese, too much personal greed, and then cheesehood, ultimate infinite cheese. That would be nirvana. And then the path would be realistic view about that cheese down to mindfulness of cheese, down to samadhi on cheese. Eightfold path. In mouse language. That's right. <laughs> then the ox is the next one who arrived, and then the tiger. Anyway, never mind. So, ji So, ta. Uh, so, but Kalachakra, then Buddha shows a body to us that is made of all of time. You know, the fingers, the, the 360 days of the lunar year are his joints of his 24 hands, you know. You know, the three joints on each finger. So, the, the, et cetera. You know, everything is like an aspect of time. And so he's showing, that, so Kala Chakra, therefore, to the chakra, the wheel, means machine. So actually, Kala Chakra really means time machine. And in that sense of the sort of two truths, the time part is the absolute. And the absolute then is the non-dual with the relative, which is the machine. And the machine is not like something that you travel around in time in. The machine is the universe. The Buddha shapes that into a machine of evolution of beings to evolve toward their own freedom from suffering. And, to, and in their perception of those beings, they think that takes them a long time of evolution. But from Buddha's perspective, he already sees where they're going to get. And because he's not a he didn't create, he didn't create the universe to start of ignorance, but he creates the Kala Chakra machine, which reshapes the universe of ignorance into a universe of m maximizing the freedom from ignorance, if you follow that which I think you can. I think I did. <laughs> and, right? So that's a time machine. That's why, that's why it really is the time machine Buddha. But it's time is the machine. When we hear time machine, we think of H.G. Wells or that movie where the guy has the dial, goes brrrr, you know, goes here and there. Has to travel in something because we're thinking of a non-emptiness way that, that the flow of time is absolute. 
you know, that there's no relativity about time. Time just has to be absolute. I mean, there's relativity in your experience of it, but it's a flow that, you know, therefore you can't change the past, for example. Whereas, of course, you can change the past. We change it all the time. And, uh, and when we are Buddhas, we will change the past. We will definitely do that. That's what Buddhas do. So therefore, the Kala Chakra and the language of the Kala Chakra, for example, in the first chapter, in the language of the Kala Chakra, <clears throat> the Kala Chakra Buddha is sometimes called the Adi Buddha, which means like the primal Buddha, primordial Buddha. Adi means first. And uh, um, it's the closest to a theistic or a monotheist. Well, no, all Buddha is called the Devati Deva. Even in the Hinayana, they call him Devati Deva, the god beyond the gods. Because when he went into the ancestral temple, I think I mentioned this in an earlier class, when his father took the baby into the Hindu temple, the, the Vedic temple, it wasn't Hindu yet, they like called the Vedic temple, to greet the temple of the ancestors. The deities in the, in the temple got down off, the, off their pedestals, came over and paid homage to the Buddha, and then they went back to becoming statues. So then the god said, wow, this guy is a god beyond the gods, a deva, ati deva, the god of the gods, something like that, which is therefore one of the original names of Buddha. So they always had that idea, but it's really graphically made, and, and therefore it's not surprising if some Buddhists in history, I think they did, they ended up like almost getting into like an absolute, almost a monotheistic thing about Kala Chakra and thinking somehow Kala Chakra created the world, which he didn't. But you create the world, you have the experience of creating a world when you practice on Excel Yoga Tantra, if any of you do, when you do a sadhana. And a sadhana is where you go into the, you completely reshape all the energies of the world and you create a community where you are all the members of the community in that 722 deities and, uh, and, and who are all in the community and they're also there all around constituting the world. Now, to go back, oh yeah, this is another nice one. This is a different mandala again because I couldn't find it. There is one up by the Kala Chakra, partial one like this someone did. But um, uh, this also shows you how, I just, want, I just put it in here. Ugh. So sorry. Oh no, that's my fifth dollar, sixth dollar lama novel. I have to close that. Sorry. What happened? Hello, PowerPoint. Don't crash. I think it did crash. Oh dear. Oh, where are you? Moved or deleted? <laughs> oh, that's terrible. That can't be. Or is it? Was it in this one? Oh yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> two, t <laughs> two versions of. And this shows you that flat thing that we saw with the three buildings. This is only a one building mandala. It's, uh, it's again a uh, Yamantika one. And this is without all the ornamentation and the texturing. Just gives you the basic idea. You go in the gate. In there is a thing with petals. It's a, it's a different kind of thing. Then you see the rafters. And so when you learn to do this kind of creation stage practice, you learn actually those beams are made of emerald or ruby, solid ruby or emerald or diamond, the white color is. They're all, it's all jewel plasma shaped like this, like jewel plexiglass, let's call it. And, the, and this, is the, this is the sort of wall structure. That's the ventilation thing in the tropical area palace. And the things, this is a very partial, but it just gives you an idea of how you rise from this, you see. How this actually is a three-dimensional thing, and I, I just couldn't find this now. The, uh, there's one like this for the Kala Chakra, but I couldn't find. And um, you know, the, the Kala Chakra is kind of a skyscraper, the central palace in the Kala Chakra. And within the central palace, there's a little tower where Kala Chakra and the eight Shaktis uh, are, uh, which is a kind of little tower within the central building. 
And it's a, it, it's a really beautiful, it's an extraordinary thing, and all made of jewels. And these outer, these outer rows there, there are 88 uh, mantra letters there, and each of those mantra letters is the seed syllable of a deity. And in those deities, in those 88 things include, you know, the 12, uh, the 27 lunar mansions, the 12 uh, zodiac signs, the um, old people like Vishnu and Shiva, etc. Another form of them are out there. And uh, the days of the week, uh, days of the month, and so on. So there are all these, like, deities that constitute sort of ordinary time. That's the equivalent of the of the charnel grounds that are outside the, the realm of the mandala. And uh, this is, the, the, although they're depicted here, on the wind circle, the dark colored circle there, uh, outside is the wind circle, you see. And then there's a water circle and a fire circle, and, and uh, as you go inward, you know, and uh, like that. And, um, and then these are blazing flames outside your universe, so no negative things can come into your universe when you're Kala Chakra. And it has a Vajra force field. Those yellow things you see there are Vajra force field, which is spherical. And the flames that are shooting out of multicolored flames are also spherical, you know, although it's here as a flat circle. And then these buildings, and those, those th things that are lying flat coming out like that, those are actually gatehouses, three-story gatehouses that go up, come up over the gates. But that's, that's how it's drawn. And the little floral things you see out there, those are eave ornaments hanging from the eaves of the upper building. And so it's like a blueprint of the building, which they understand. And the way they make it is marvelous in the ritual, the monks. As you know, you've probably all seen them where they have this like wedding cake ornamenting type of cone and with a little rough thing on it and they rub it with a, with a chopstick or a thing like that and they make a little vibration and then it creates a line of very fine powder and then they have, they're wearing bandanas like bandits but that's not to breathe because the powder is so, it could easily be moved by the breath. And, uh, and then they make elaborate, they make this exquisite thing with that, with that powder. And so this is a powder mandala, color particle mandala, initiatory mandala. It's amazing, actually, what they do, and they work out from inside. But when they're doing it, supposedly, I mean, the adept ones, are, there's a ritual being performed by the monks around them who are reading it, although they've all memorized this little 120 single space, space thing. And they are, they are visualizing the whole mandala, the hologram is around them, the, the palace. And then certain main architectural lines in the palace, they're imagining that they draw down and they embed it in lines in the two-dimensional thing. You follow me? They bring, they flatten the whole thing in a way cosmically into the two-dimensional thing. And then furthermore, they visualize that every tiny grain of the powder contains the whole mandala universe in it. And that's why when they later sweep up the powder and then they entrust it to the Nagas, the serpent water beings, the water serpent dragon snake beings in the ocean, but through the rivers, uh, they, are, they feel that every grain, every grain of that powder has the whole mandala in it. There's the, like a Samantabhadra thing, like holographic vision of the universe. They completely are into that, evolving. So that's why that thing, and I had actually a super normal experience myself in 1965 when I was an idiot monk, uh, before I was an idiot professor, don't worry. <laughs> I'm not implying anything. But when I was, first time I saw the powder mandala in Dharamsala in 1965, in a line, you know, I was, because I, well, I had a little privilege in the line because I was a monk, but I went around and, uh, and this voice spoke in my, my Walter Cronkite voice went off, you know, which is the voice of the divine or something, you know. It wasn't my voice, it was like Walter Cronkite. It was me, the ultimate, it always expresses himself, never as George Burns. George Burns used to play God, you know, but that never convinced me. God wouldn't smoke a cigar like that and behave like that. But, but uh, Cronkite was like, so that voice said to me, if human beings can make anything that beautiful, it is possible to attain Buddhahood. Okay, thanks, Walter. <laughs> so do I have CBS's guarantee of that? Yes, oh, great. <laughs> Something in my unconscious, probably. 
But it was really marvelous. And some of you, many of you, how many of you have seen it? One of the ones where the monks make it. We used to have it in our art shows even. We'd get them to come and make it. Good, I'm glad you have it. This is amazing. It's so vivid. And it has such an energy about it. It's a, and then they sweep it up, throw it away, which is amazing. Now, oh, this is the Hanksha Malavaraya. You know, the Kal Chakra Cosmic Mantra. Om Ahum Ho Hanksha Malavaraya Humpe. Famous 10 syllable mantra. This is the Kal Chakra uh, Yidam. You know, what, that's what you are. And you are both male and female, by the way, when you are that. This is serious transgender. Because you, you can be in your ordinary body, either male or female, doesn't matter, or both. But when you're visualizing yourself as a Kala Chakra, you are both the male and the female in the, in the sadhana. Which doesn't mean also not that in some, there are yogas in Kala Chakra where you work with a partner. But when you're vainly visualizing it, you are everyone. And unfortunately, we can't see in this um, uh, projection because of whatever that um, the side deities, but all of the, a lot of the main side deities are, you know, surrounding deities are in little cartouches around that thing. That's an old painting. And this is really, I like this one. And this is, you know, I know I don't like the background on this. Well, I don't want to do that now. But anyway, these are the, this is the great bliss wheel, what it's called. You know, there's, there's um, body wheel, speech wheel, mind wheel, great bliss wheel. And uh, miraculous activity wheel, even outside here. So there are five wheels. But, but this is the innermost wheel, the great bliss wheel. And there you are in the center as Mr. and Mrs. Kalachakra. She has eight arms, and she also has four faces. And uh, he, she's golden, her body, golden color. He's black color. But his right leg is red, and left leg is white. And um, then he, he has the 24 arms which are red, white, and black. And she has eight arms, which are all gold. And, but then there are these eight goddesses around them called the eight shaktis, uh, powers, the eight energies. And what they are is eight of the 10 paramitas embodied. You know, dana paramita, shila paramita, that generosity, ethicality, tolerance, uh, creativity, uh, creativity, concentration, wisdom, uh, art, uh, prayer, power, and knowledge, and rain cloud of the Dharma. And uh, if that's 10, or maybe knowledge is the 10th, then rain cloud of the Dharma is the name of the state. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. And, uh, and, that, and th she and he are, uh, she is three beings. She's Vishwamata, which is the same as Kala Chakra, but she also is Prajna Paramita and Jnana Paramita. She's wisdom, transcendence, and, and the sixth and the tenth Paramitas. So these are the other eight, these, these eight goddesses around. Each of them has four faces and eight arms, like her. And um, uh, this is correct because the, the black ones are in the down side, which is the east side, the direction he faces. And the red is the south, and the white is the north, north and northeast, and then the yellow and the northwest are the, are the, are the ones above. This is a very vivid, I think in the future I will not use the orange background for these slides. Then this is the, of course, these are the Kala Chakra chakras, because the Kala Chakra chakra system is a tiny bit different in some respects than the Kriya Samaja and the other ones. And it makes more of a fuss about this super brain chakra, which is actually above your head. It's your Ushnisha chakra and the genital chakra, also having 32 petals below the navel chakra, where you have 64. The heart chakra still has eight. And then the, the, the throat chakra has more. It has uh, 32, actually, like the genital chakra. And uh, the brain chakra only has 24 because it has another chakra on top of it, five. You know. So there are six chakras in the Kala Chakra system. You know, there's the same central channel and same right and left channels, which you see are, and then the right and left channel go a little differently at the bottom part. So there, you know, that's all software programming. So, and then the Kala Chakra, okay, anyway, so okay, you have creation stage. 
Okay, now, in that creation stage, just so to, just to you realize what it is, you know, which is that we're not pretending that we can necessarily do this. Some of you may have the initiation, you may be working a little bit at it, and that's good to do. Even if you don't really fully know what you're doing, it sort of creates an affinity. When, when after you die in your next life or something, you'll have that affinity, or maybe some later time in this life. So it's important to sort of keep connected to, the, to, the, to it, even if you're not that great about it. But it helps to be encouraged to do that, to know what it is. So what it is is, you know, and that's why you have to have some initial understanding of emptiness, which means that you understand that you are a work in progress. Because right now, in your sense of identifying yourself as an ordinary person with an ordinary body, you have a model of yourself in your brain, in your central nervous system. And brain is in the whole body, actually. So your central nervous system has a model of you in it. And you have two arms and you know, 10 fingers, etc. You know, the sense organs that you have, and the limbs and the muscles and all this. And you have a model of yourself as a tree-like thing like that, with these, ne these ganglia, these nexi, nexi, up and down the central channel, and then branching out into thousands and tens of thousands of nerve, nerve channels, and energy canals, and fluid, and nerves, and so on. And uh, so what you're doing in the creation stage is you're imagining that you melt all of that down. You let go of that. You become a pure awareness that is not invested automatically and indelibly in the model of yourself in your central nervous system. You then, uh, but you can't sort of think directly of the central nervous system necessarily. So you then think of yourself, if you're doing Kala Chakra, as being a male in union with a female, and you're sort of on both sides of that union. You're both the female and the male. That's already really complicated. <laughs> then you have three shoulder joints, three windpipes, and three necks. And uh, the back one somehow just hovers there without a neck. <laughs> I don't know how, the yellow one in the back. You have these three necks. You have six shoulders, and three on each side. Then you have six upper arms. And then you have uh, 12 lower arms, uh, forearms, and hands. And they're different colors, etc. You only have two legs. And, um, but, you, but you actually have four legs because you also are the female. So you're this weird being. You're both of them. And, and you're very in love with this yourself. <laughs> the male part of you is in love with the female part of you, and the female part is in love with the male part of you. So you're very like that. But you're not just looking at each other because each of you has three other faces with three eyes in each face. And you're looking in all directions. So you're, you're aware of everything in all directions, plus this, like, the way the chest chakra splits out into this fan of, of, of uh, things, and you're holding implements in each of them that symbolize specific mental powers and abilities and things, you know, tools for getting things done. And your body is made of pure time also. So, of course, at first, it, it's, you can't even, you have to even memorize all the things that are in the 24 ha hands. And you know, the, the colors of the backs of the fingers, thumb and fingers are different colors, the five wisdom colors. And the uh, front joints are red, white, and blue, red, white, and black. And the fingernails have different colors. So, I mean, it's complicated to do that. But if you visualize yourself, as you practice it bit by bit, and of course, it also helps if in your practice of the exoteric, you develop very good stability of mind, where you can concentrate on one thing without wavering quite strongly. Because then you concentrate on feeling like what it feels like to be in such an embodiment. And as you can see, what is the purpose of that? What it would feel like, there's one way of how it would feel externally, in a sense, that you'd be looking in all directions, you'd be sort of aware of everything all around you, and you would therefore be looking upon other beings around you in a mandala palace, although at the first minute you don't deal with that, you just sort of create yourself. And you're looking at all of these other beings, and yet you're feeling you're also them looking at you. You imagine that too, so you are all of them. You give birth to them, kind of, and there's a process in the sadhana where you give birth to them. And then, no, not only that, there's another process in the sadhana where you have all of them in different joints of your body, like the 12 body 
the trail body uh, lotuses, which I showed you in the first the powder mandala you saw in the body mandala, they're in your wrists and elbows and shoulders and, uh, and, and hip bone, hip and knee and ankle. So there's 12, uh, 12 complete 30, 30 deity chakras in each of them, you know. And then you, uh, so you're completely made out of them as well. It's a body mandala thing, what they call a body mandala. So, but anyway, th that's more complicated. But when you, when you do, even just to do that, you can imagine if you were, had such a body to sort of wiggle one of your three middle red arms holding, um, you know, an elephant goad with a noose in the other hand, uh, in, the, in the matching uh, red hand, uh, to wiggle that, you have a whole different neural structure inside your chest, inside which is, it connects to your brain and your central nervous system. So what you're doing is, in, by imagining that, you're making a, uh, through using your imagination that way, you're creating a different openness and a greater sensitivity to the subtle patternings of the central nervous system. And you, and you reach the stage in the creation stage where that becomes so strong for you that you really feel that you are that body. Just like right now, I feel I'm this with my two arms. In that state, you feel you really have that. That's what you are. You feel like that. You feel what it feels like that. Can you, can you imagine that? So you've actually, you've created a sort of openness, but on the other hand, it's not stuck because you know that's not absolute, although you could maybe feel like, wow, I'm really called chakra, but you're not stuck in that because then you can leave the mandala, you can melt that down, and you can come back to being your ordinary self again. So you don't get stuck in some sort of psychotic separate world where you can't come out of it. But apparently it feels really good to be a 24-arm, multicolored, three-colored person in union with an uh, eight-armed, four-faced, golden person. Hi, Bo, come on in. And uh, to, um, to feel that that's what you are, apparently that feels pretty good. Especially because uh, you imagine, of course, being Kala Chakra, you are not doing some ordinary, genitally organized sex. Although you're in union, in sexual union, of a certain, you know, the organs are touching, but uh, they are, the, what they are doing is they are generating orgasmic energy all up and down the chakra system. So the orgasm is not just happening there in the bottom chakra, it's happening all the way up and down and flows back and forth up and down. And, and the, the ultimate place for it, of course, to stay is the heart, actually. And they only show the heart as eight petals because that's the immediate thing, but actually then it branches to being 24, which is very important, which, is, which the chakra sambar is especially very good at. So, so and, and you have to do that. You have to develop that ability because then you're going into the, then when you reach the where you really can shift into being in that Kala Chakra universe, and you're the Kala Chakra in the Kala Chakra universe with your self replicated in a clan, kind of a bunch of clans and families, a tribe, of your, or which are all you, you feel completely identified with all of them, you know. Um, when you do that, then you begin to do this subtle yoga where you begin to, Visualize the whole thing in your body everywhere and then in every atom of your body and then you begin to go into the perfection stage You begin to go into this where you start going through the process of death The process of rebirth and there are process of then re-emanation and you start going into these things where if you didn't have this openness in the nervous system you would you might actually die and you might completely get freaked out, or you might go nuts, or whatever, you know, get so long, what they call it, become crazed. And all kinds of terrible things could happen to you. Which is why, you know, now the Nyingma, the Nyingma tradition, and that some, of the, some of the other tantric traditions in ancient India, because the Nyingma thing was, after all, formed at an earlier phase of the Indian tradition, began in the 7th century. And it really got strong in the 8th, 9th century was when the Nyingma tradition sort of had its founding moments. <clears throat> and at that time, there was no Kala Chakra present in India. And uh, some of the more elaborate 
uh, the whole literature of the commentaries, etc., had not developed because, not because they didn't exist, actually, and the knowledge wasn't there. The knowledge was there, we argue, and we insist, from Buddha's time, actually. And actually, internally, it was there from other worlds in the past. But in India, and in on in the planet Earth, it was there from, from Buddha's time, definitely. And we say, but they kept it genuinely secret for about 1,100 years from Buddha's time. They really didn't have text. They really kept it secret. Because, why? Because, you know, the initiation ceremony is like a royal consecration. Now, the kings of the earlier period in Indian civilization, different Indian nations, because there was many nations in India, they might not have appreciated some untouchables and some weird mix of people going out somewhere in a temple and like becoming kings, you know and having ceremonies that were reserved for them and their Brahmins. You know. It's not just sex or anything. It's the whole idea of the individual feeling, I'm a king, you know. You know? Remember Thomas Paine? The Common Sense, the American Revolution? Did you ever read that pamphlet, any of you in your American history book? He has this wonderful thing about how the crown of the king has these gems that represent the consensual will of the people, which are the gems of the love and trust and faith of the people. And what a revolution, what democracy is, where you shatter that crown, and then every being has a piece of the, one of the gems, you know, which is their vote, you know, their, their power, their own individual power. A beautiful symbol for democracy that he wrote. So the tantric thing is that. So they had to wait for India to develop uh, really, you know, the, through the monastic vehicle, through the general Mahayana, Bodhisattva vehicle, etc., to develop a stronger appreciation of the female, a less violent thing about the male, and a stronger sense of individuality overall, where people were, you know, where people were not afraid of feeling really that, you know, I can be king too, you know. You know, there's all those things about the yoga, and even when, of course, India always had that in a way. That's why Buddha chose India, because Indian, the, 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 the Vedic society was established by nomads. The so-called Aryans who came to India were nomads originally, so they had somewhere in the root of their culture this nomadic thing, and nomads are, tend to be more individualistic than people who live in cities. People live in agricultural cities, it's a hierarchy. They can know they have to deliver the grain over here, and then somebody processes it, and somebody else does that, and then they buy their shoes, etc. You know, cities develop this kind of thing where people fit into a group. You have castes, you know, you have different, different identities like that. Whereas the nomad, everybody kind of does everything, and they wander around, and they don't really follow the leader quite so much. They can't, because they have to raise their animals somewhere else, you know. which may have been one of the reasons why Tibetans took so much to it right away. But anyway, because if you look at it like that, from the time Tantra became public in India, more public in India, it was still esoteric, but it was more known. There was a literature, there was going to be a library from the sixth century or so, about 1100 years after Buddha. That's just very shortly after that, it starts to move into Tibet, actually. Interesting. Just thought of that myself. So this is why it's no joke, the Tantra, actually. And this is why the Dalai Lama says, when sometimes 100, you know, 200, 300,000 people come to the Kala Chakra, because it's kind of, Tibetan culture has become like a picnic or something. But he says, there might be one or two of us here able to really work on this. I'm not really qualified to give this initiation. You're not really qualified to receive it, but we go through it as a blessing. There's a tradition about it, he said. Someday in future lives, we'll all do it really like yogis, and we'll really know it and understand it. He always says that. I don't know if, you're, if some of you have you been there, if you know that. He invariably says that, which is very good to say. And it's very correct in a way. But of course, he is very qualified to do it, actually, himself. And there may be a few more people than that, indeed. But it's much best, even those who are really going to try to use it, it's good that they think of themselves that way and don't get all take their vestigial, you know, absolutist habit pattern of self-identity and transfer it onto, now I'm Kala Chakra, like, I'm not going to wash the dishes. <laughs> How can I wash dishes with my 24 arms or I might break them all? You know, ridiculous. But I know some people who behave like that. I do. So, um, okay. So, and there's, yeah, there's a focus on the, 
on this one. And uh, I just love it, I must say. I do love the palette. Of the Kaltaka palette, this is where it shows all the different things in the hands, you know. There are the things, you know, when you start to learn it, you use things like that. You know. Okay, any question? Any questions? Anybody have any questions? Yes? Is, is, is empowerment required to do that kind of experiential <laughs> exercise that you're describing? Yes, it does. And that's why people keep taking it again and again, because <laughs> you get lost in it, actually, a little bit. But the only one I know who had a real glimpse of it was my wife. She's always, I'm so jealous, but I can't help it. But anyway, it's good that I am. It's good that she's way behind me. She, I can tell from her description she had that she really had a glimpse of it all. And it is, a, it is really amazing. You know, you get reborn again and again in the initiation. You, know, you dissolve, then you arise in a Buddha body, then you float over and you go into the mouth of the Kala Chakra, and then you're born from the womb of the female part of the Kala Chakra, and then you're placed, then you're placed in the mandala, and then this and that, and then this and that, the deities come. The Shaktis come and they fix your turban and they put your hat on and all this kind of stuff. And you can't, almost impossible to follow it unless you really know all the iconography and, you know. So, this, you know, once you're an adept, when you, then you again you get him. Actually, I don't like the word empowerment also, by the way. I don't like that word. People wrongly think that this tantric thing, somehow there's some power coming to you. You're just like you're gassing up at the, <laughs> you know, at the pump, you know, it's like in-flight refueling, you know. Huh? from the Lama, but that's not correct. The Wang Kurwa, the word for, that is translated Wang Kurwa in Tibetan, which means conferral, Wang by itself can mean power, but it also is short for Wang Bo, which means a prince. So conference, a conferral of princedom. And the Sanskrit word is Abhisheka, which means a, an anointment. So it's actually like a coronation ceremony. Now, when you coronate a crown prince, you know, by sort of place that they are, then eventually can become a king. But they didn't get an extra power by being coronated. They just occupied a certain position, in a way, a position of a a potential power, but they don't get power in the initiation. They get anointed, you know. And so, uh, because of the ambiguity in Tibetan, if you leave out the suffix particle, wang po, which means a prince, Indra. You know, it's a translation of Indra. Uh, and this means the conferral of the prince, the mana prince, which you do by anointing the prince in a coronation ceremony, right? So, so when we, the, the, way we've used, the way that some Tibetans have translated it and Tibetan scholars translate it, empowerment, it gives people the wrong idea that I gotta go get more initiations because I'm getting more power every initiation I get, which actually is the opposite. Every initiation you get, when you don't know what it is, luckily when you don't know what it is, you're really getting a blessing. But, which is why they so casually do it, because they don't feel obliged, they're responsible. But if you really got it, because you knew what the vows were, and you knew really what the practice is, and you knew that, what you're getting is something you have to maintain, and if you don't, you have problems, actually. So you're getting a kind of burden of responsibility. What? I can't hear you. Well, you can say it's an initiation, but readiness for a practice and readiness for assuming a responsibility, like a prince then has to learn how to be a king or they're going to make a mess, you know. And, uh, and uh, they, they don't learn that by getting anointed. The anointment just is, okay, now you have the track, you can go there, right? And I think there's a subliminal thing. It's like they say, to, to conceive the spirit of enlightenment, the Bodhisattva vow, you have to meet someone who has the spirit of enlightenment. They say to understand selflessness you, or emptiness, you have to meet someone who understands emptiness. Now you can meet them through the book they wrote, if it's properly transmitted and <laughs> preserved and, and in, in its own language and, then, and or pro- properly translated into another language if you don't know that language. You could in some way meet them through their book, as imperfect as that may be or as language may be. But they say somehow it's a subliminal thing that, you know, when, why when people meet the Dalai Lama, they flip out or some other high beings. Sometimes they do it f- for the wrong reason and that they project some great thing upon them that is not really there and they become sort of mesmerized. 
but when you meet the real one, you feel that there's a, you feel a different presence opposite you. You know, in the sort of Buddhist thing of this mountain, the other mountain, you know, where, you know, you meet someone and, you know, you, you're over here, and of course you imagine they're over there. And then you kind of reach out timidly and shake hands, you know, like, I mean, we're not going to fight or something, you know. But when you meet someone who's both over with you as well as over there, subliminally, you may not recognize that and you want to project, oh yeah, they're just thinking like me. But you feel another, you feel like subsumed in a different kind of energy. Because the other person feels they're, just, they're, they're empathizing with you totally. A enlightened person is. You know, it's not that they're looking great. And, and therefore, a person like that, like the, that's why Dalai Lama doesn't need, he doesn't at all need to have somebody out there blowing a trumpet in your face and telling you to grovel down and, and he's so holy and, you know, a bunch of PR that they have in their ceremonies. He doesn't need that. And that's why, you know, I remember once, the first Kala Chakra he did in Wisconsin. At one point in that ritual, he says, uh, he, he puts on some kind of hat, you know, and he says, and then he, he puts on this hat, and then he takes it off, says, I hate this hat. It's like, it makes my scalp itch, and he takes it off again and changes into a very conversational tone and starts scratching his head and acting really like totally ordinary and breaks the spell, you know. And then, then right around that same point in the liturgy, he says, now I am your lama, now I am your guru, now you must do what I say. And then again, he breaks the, the spell and he goes, except if I say something stupid, don't do it. <laughs> he says, and so the eyes could look down the road and say, people, oh, you know, oh, he ruined my, he ruined my fantasy here, you know. <laughs> I was getting empowered and this was really put up there. Now he's like saying, oh, don't do it. If he might say something stupid and just say, it itches his head, and he doesn't care about that. And they were like really disappointed. They wanted to be part of the theater. They wanted to depend on someone other than themselves. He keeps always pushing it. These Indian people once, the Tara Wang, you know, Tara initiation, Tara blessing was being called in that particular thing. And he says, well, I have no blessing for you. <laughs> They're like, what, I got my ticket, where's my blessing? He said, no, I don't have a blessing for you. He said, I don't have any blessing for you, he said. But we do this anyway, but it just gives you an excuse to bring the Tara out in yourself your own blessing. Then, the few, the, then a few of them who weren't too much into like wanting to depend on somebody else, they were, they were impressed. It, it enforced their sense of the responsibility and potentiality too. Yes, what? Carol, what? I'm sorry. No, there's no transmission. That's a you know, differential transmission. That's in your car. This transmission is a bunch of BS. It's an exploitation, actually. It leads to exploitation. Oh, I'm going to transmit you something. Oh, great, thank you. Here's my ticket. I'll pay you a lot of money. Please transmit to me. There's a specific statement in the Buddhas do not transmit their understanding into another's mind. If they, because why? It is self-contradictory. If they could do that, that they don't do that, unless you go to this and that ceremony and buy your ticket and do whatever and pay a bit, then they are full of it. Then they have no compassion. If Buddha would have transmitted his mind to everybody 2,500 years ago, and every mouse would be a Buddha. Now, you know, they, 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 they can't do that. That would be body snatching, you know? There's a Doctor Who thing where some crazy guy tries to become everybody in the whole society, and he has this projector. <laughs> it's horrible. They have to escape from that guy. Yes, Carol, Christy, what did you want to say? Well, isn't it a contradiction? Is it on? Yeah. What? Isn't it a contradiction? Um, is it on? Just shout, just shout. Can you hear me, Bob? Yeah, I hear you. Okay. Isn't it a contradiction to say that for some reason we do need to meet someone who has at least a, an inkling toward enlightenment? Has No. That we need that to meet them. No, it isn't but a contradiction. at the same time we say, Tara, we ha have the nature of Tara. And no, it isn't a contradiction because, and I didn't say you have to meet in person, even if you're somewhere where they're not there. They say you have to, but because they have, they have left texts, we are fortunate to be in a world where there are texts and there are books and instructions and etc. 
There are various types of presence. I'm not saying, I mean, there are a few Dalai Lamas and people like that, but it's a subliminal thing. The, the reason that it's not contradictory is they're not transmitting their mind into you, but you subliminally, your own mind suddenly feels there's a way to be different than I am. And, but you have to bring that out of yourself. But it's the idea that there's a doorway that you can get there. It isn't that you instantly are there because you meet this person. That would be a transmission thing. But when you encounter someone like that, then you feel, I could do that. Subliminally, you don't necessarily personally, you know, analytically feel that because I said subliminal. It's subliminal. Mm -hmm. It's, a, it's a, like a double bind thing. You have to realize it yourself. No one else can realize it for you. But in order to realize it yourself, you have to meet someone else who has realized it for themselves. And that's why we are especially fortunate beings, because we're in a world where there still is a record. Thus have I heard at, on a special occasion. Thus did I hear on a special occasion, someone remembered what Buddha said. We have Heart Sutra. We have, we have the idea that this is possible. There are many people who don't think that's possible. You go ask Vladimir Putin, you know, can Russians attain Buddhahood? I don't think so. What? Are you a heretic? No way. You have to obey orders. March. We're going to go conquer the Ukraine tomorrow after we fix Syria. No, they don't believe that. Therefore, they just want to have power and they think that's all you can do because they justify how they behave because human beings are only a certain way. They're all selfish. Therefore, they need military control. You know, you can go back to Confucius with that. You know, that's in every society. So, I don't think it's a contradiction, if you understand it right. You could say, par is paradox the same as a contradiction? Contradiction might be a crippling thing, whereas paradox involves the ability to embrace ambivalence, to embrace ambiguity. The ability to embrace ambiguity, let's say. That, I think, is not only, I think that's what Buddha's mind can do, can be self and other at the same time. That's an embracing of ambiguity. From the point of view of someone who thinks you can only be one thing at a time. But uh, contradiction would be some crippling thing, which means it can't, it's impossible. Or you have to like, have blind faith about it, and therefore you can't understand anything. Then you can run around like some of these people do, who pretend to, pretend to be great authorities, but this, who can say, the greatest thing is to cultivate don't know mind. If you don't know anything, then you're really enlightened. <laughs> that's what they say. And they act like that's a real achievement. That's really great. I'm really great. I don't know anything. That's, that's the war cry and the cry of triumph of enlightenment is duh. <laughs> yes. Um, so it's, it's said that to practice visual. Uh, Visualization, there is a, we don't start with the full um, 24 arms and full form. So can you talk a little bit about the I, I Sahaja um, form of Kala Chakra? When we start the practice of the Sadhana, there's a simplified form that we can actually start with, which is two arms and a single body. I'm sorry, I'm, I, I can hear the volume of your voice, but I can't quite make out. Can someone translate he, for me? Yeah, he asked that, there, is there a simplified form of the Kala Chakra that we could use to start? Oh, yeah. Well, you could, there's two arms, Kala Chakra, and so on. But, but no, you have to do the whole thing. And the, you wouldn't want to, I mean, people don't want the Kala Chakra unless they're ready to do the whole thing. There are simplified other deities where there's only two arms, you know, and, uh, and you know, where there's a more humanoid type of body, normal type of body. They don't need that complicated thing unless they're getting it, unless they somehow feel that's necessary for them. And... Uh, you know, there's a huge, you could say like, um, you know, is there a simplified form of this or that complex medicine? Yes, there are simpler medicines, but then there are some really complicated ones for some complicated conditions, you know. But the, basically, the human being is a really complicated thing. Human being is very complex. The brain, the nervous system is really complicated. And, um, you know, the, the, the tantric mandala is, fits the complexity of the ordinary with the extraordinary in order to transform the ordinary into the extraordinary. In the creation stage, what you're doing is creating an extraordinary world, the best of all possible, a model for the best of all possible worlds. 
Because when you become a Buddha, you're creating the best of all possible worlds. Contra Voltaire, you're creating the best of all possible worlds for everybody, right? Which would be, imagine if you could shape the world where you wouldn't have to sit in a concrete room like this and people sort of think of things through words and show some pictures and do that and the other. But somehow, the environment itself, the chair they sat in, you know, it was like multimedia. And the pillar turned into Kalachakra right in front of their eyes, you know, because the whole thing could like speak to them in a certain way. You know, that would really be something, you know. And um, actually, the medicine Buddha thing, for example, there's only just a two arm Buddha, and you could, if you want to be a doctor, you visualize yourself as medicine Buddha. And you're blue, you know, and you have this plant in it, you know, and then you visualize that your world becomes this world of healing plants. And you shape all the things that grow in the world to be communicating with the humans and to feed them and to be there to, to adapt them and to help them, and et cetera, just produce just the leaf they need and this and that. Of course, they have to know how to, which one this which per person needs. So you teach that in the form of an elaborate manual and a text, as the medicine Buddha does. That's a really marvelous idea, that you go to medical school. Medical school is an initiation. It would be as if in our medical schools, the first thing you did was you met Hippocrates. And then the Hippocratic Oath was where you started. And you met and you visualized, or you visualized Asclepius, the Greek god of healing. And you had a yoga of becoming Asclepius and reading everybody's dreams and mind to know what was wrong with them, to get the diagnosis from them, from their unconscious mind. You became like a human CAT scan. You didn't need all this expensive machinery. You just projected your mind to where you could just read every fiber in their body. That would be really cool. So there are different things for different persons. Yes, please, but I, you, know, you talk in this. No, no, you want to ask another question, please. It's just I'm, the way you speak, you know, because you, you're, you're speaking very thoughtfully, so you're sort of syncopated in the way you pronounce, so I can't quite figure out what you said, um, that's all. It just it reminds me of what you mentioned just now about medicine Buddha. It reminds me of uh, how in the Chinese traditions where which tradition have, um, Chinese Chinese uh, pure lamp the uh, yellow practice. emperor. You mean um, my my mom is my mom is uh, it belongs to the pure land uh, practice and they and there's a lot of visualizations about Amidaba and sometimes medicine Buddha as well. So well in Chinese tradition you have Yao Shu Fo. But you have medicine Buddha. Yes, in yeah, yeah. Yao Shu Fo. And so, so that, would you say that's like proto-tantric practice in some stuff? Like the, what? Those are the earlier forms of tantric vis visualizations because they imagine, actually visualize the, the pure light itself. Oh, yeah. And Taoism, a great Taoism has a lot of tantric stuff. There's Taoist Tantra, sure. Yeah. No, but I'm, I'm asking about the Chinese pure land Buddhist practices where... But somehow China seemed to need something from India. Yes. I know they're very Zhongho. <laughs> center of the world. But somehow, Confucius couldn't manage his local rulers. Although, you know, from the Tibetan legendary point of view, and probably my Indian, Manjushri, Bodhisattva of Wisdom, his incarnation was Confucius, actually. Wow. They have such a legend. Really? Confucius felt sorry for Chinese people because they had a big culture even then, but, although they had too many floods, actually. But they had a big culture, and then... And then uh, Buddha didn't go there. Buddha chose to be born on the other side of the Tibetan massif, you know, Himalaya, the roof of the world, and Nepal, and, Tibet, and India. And so he felt sorry, so he went and incarnated as Confucius. But if you know the history, the Duke of Lu and uh, the Zhou Empire, which was only nominal at that time, and then Qin and Chu and all the states, they didn't pay attention to Confucius. They didn't listen to him. He didn't have tenure. He didn't get a job. And then the Jin emperor eventually burned all his books. Yeah. Totally destroyed. And somehow they reconstructed Confucius. But otherwise, he destroyed all of the Confucian literature. Mengzi, Zhongzi, uh, Confucius, they destroyed all of it. Yeah, those, that those legalist guy, thing. you know? The nasty Mao-like guy. Yeah. He destroyed the previous culture because he didn't like the liberal aspect of Confucius. So somehow, and the Han Dynasty, later Han Dynasty, they felt they needed Buddha. Uh, that Indian import, who needs that stuff? They're all chaotic over there in India. They don't have a good economy. And they didn't have the, the communists never controlled India. I don't know why we need that from India, but they did. 
They did. Even some of them, they developed a nice legend that Lao Tzu was Buddha. Lao Tzu went across the pass, and to, to so, across the bed, and went to India, and then he became Buddha. He, he uh, def, that's good. That's a nice way of including and overcoming that nationalist ego idea, like, we're the Chinese, you know, like, we're the Indians, we're the Americans. We all have to overcome all of that now, right? Don't you agree? I think so. Buddhism helps with that, too. It helps that kind of identity thing, national identity thing. Zhong Guo, you know? The real John Guo is the Kala Chakra Mandala Palace. Yes, hi. So we have talked about visualizing all of these um, external details. At what point do you internalize qual emotional qualities? At what point? Emotional qualities. Well, you, 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 hey, listen, your internal is filled with emotional qualities. You, you go after your emotional qualities bit by bit when you can handle them and when they're not handling you. And, uh, and that's, that's when you go, you know, you, go, you confront your unconscious, but you need a vehicle to do that, they believe. And these are archetypes that help you confront your inner emotional qualities, you know. But you are never getting away from your emotional qualities because you are a product of your emotional qualities, you know, they control your life. And especially when they're, you're unconscious of what they really truly are, Right? You know, like the normal Western psychology thing is you're just a victim of your unconscious impulses. And Buddhism agrees with that for the other person who has not developed a certain level of self-awareness. But they consider that a very bad situation because you're helpless. It's like trucks are coming at you from outside and other people in such difficult circumstances. And then from inside, there's this whole uncontrollable world of impulses. And you are this relational, delicate thing in between your little bit of your conscious awareness and your mind and body. And you're being scratched from both directions. So the Buddhist thing is try to find out how to transmute your emotional impulses. And I must say, to bring all of this back, another reason we're looking at these advanced things what I would call the Tantric Abhidharma, you know, is that this is a course on the force for good, which we're almost at the end of. Next week we're going to celebrate being at the end of it with the Krishna Das, and we're going to chant a little bit at the end. But the fact that what all we're really aiming at here is not really practicing Tantra at all, but we're looking at the Buddhist sources of the force for good. The Dalai Lama is saying, do these simple secular things even that don't require tantras or anything. He's talking about the tantra of being a little more cheerful, a little more kind, a little more pleasant around town, having a happy family, you know. But, but to really get into them, where people in schools and things would do this, and, and doctors would learn like this way, which is what he wants, and children would be taught. You know, he said that thing like if every eight-year-old child learned a little bit of mindful meditation in every school everywhere in the world. You know, not Buddhists become Buddhists or anything, but just learn to sort of deal with their own impulses in a little better way. Then we wouldn't have wars. Then we'd have a much happier world, right? He says that. So that's his aim, you know. And the reason that we're looking at this in this course is that then this may give us confidence that he's really onto something and he, you know, that it's not just some do-gooder, nice idea, people can be nice, you know, because in a way we are conditioned to have that attitude. We are conditioned to have the attitude that, you know, we have to have a big pentagon, you know, and we have to like, we have to, we have to go bomb the ISIS and we have to do this and do that because human beings just are hopeless, you know, they never change. You know. Don't you hear that all the time from Uncle Joe, you know, like, oh, that's almost like, oh, you know. And then I'm just, I can't really take care of all that, but I, I need a lot of defense, you know. So that's the reason we've show, in this whole course, we have worked on trying to show the sources of the kind of sophisticated understanding of the human being. And, you know, branching even into politics. Like, for example, the Dalai Lama, he says, he teaches, and he has taught every world leader who's ever met him. And I think even the ones who haven't have read something or they've heard that he said something, you know, they do. Oh, I know that because like, so he, he teased when he was in Latvia last time, having a class with Russians. He, to, to an interviewer, he a little bit teased Putin. And he said he thought Putin was a little too vain and unrealistic. Just as a thing in the press, he said. 
and he was preferring that the Chinese guy was going after corruption at that time. You know, he, he wasn't saying some other things about that he's doing our good. He just said that's more realistic to sort of try to clean things up and reform things. You know, and I know that Putin found out about that because he started persecuting the Buddhists in Russia, in Russia right away. <laughs> he started getting mean to the Mongolians and the Buddhists there in Russia because he heard that. You know, so even in other words, he's told all the world leaders that you should simply rule out violence. You know, bombing people, shooting them, it's just, let's forget about it. We, that becomes a, like a cardinal rule, golden rule for everybody in the world. You never kill anybody, if possible. I mean, you know, some crazy people will still kill people now and then, but basically you don't kill anybody. You discuss when there's conflict. You have a dialogue. You have a court. You have a forum. You resolve with some sort of compromise, which you do anyway at the end of these inconclusive, horrible, violence things. You, you try to have a compromise. It's much worse when you destroyed so much, you know. And uh, he's teaching that to a whole planet. But are we listening in the planet? No, we're not listening. And we think he's a... Do, he, but I've heard so many people who even like Buddhism. They say, oh, I love the Dalai Lama, it's so great. I wish he would get out of politics, they say. Oh, he shouldn't say anything about politics. He doesn't know anything about that. Oh, no, no, politics, you have to be tough, you know. You have to fight, you have to Pentagon, more defense, more bigger defense budget, right? And that's realism. No, he's not realistic. Well, I'm trying to show that he is realistic, actually. And he knows just how the subconscious works. And he knows how, he knows what history, where history is. And history is, there are other people who don't know anything about Buddhism, have written careful studies that war is obsolete, absolutely self-destructive. Nobody wins anything in a war. No one. So why is anybody having one? You know, just totally unrealistic. Ostriches doing it. But they don't believe it when you tell them that. Because they think you're naive and they are realistic. You know, so that's the only reason we're talking about, about all these complicated <laughs> things. To give you confidence that there are people who have completely gotten into those feelings and emotions and who can really, have really ridden them in a positive way and can really transform themselves. Really love all the world and everybody. Krishna Das, who's coming next week, his slogan is from Nim Karoli Baba, who is not a Buddhist, love everybody. <laughs> And really, that's the message. The Kalachakra Mandala is a temporary sort of sequestered, or the Guya Samaj, or all of them, a sequestered realm where you can practice loving everybody. Whether you practice at an early stage of imagining that everybody is loving everybody and that thing, it's a realm where everybody wants everyone else to be blissful and happy in every conceivable way, inside and outside. And, and then the idea is that when that model is developed, then one can then try to shape the world that way, the larger world. Then the mandala, where there is a sequence in the mandala sadhana called man, some people have a very stupid translation for it, the proper one that I have is called mandala triumph. So it's where you envision, once you feel ensconced in the mandala of Kala Chakra, you envision that all beings of every type stream into you, like the great light of tractor beams goes out into the universe. And all beings of all kinds stream into that mandala. And they come into that mandala and then they feel a kind of inner exaltation of being present in this best of all possible worlds. And then they stream back out into where they are. And yet suddenly they don't feel the same degree of hatred. Instead that hatred becomes a feeling of sense of the perfection of the universe. They don't feel that jealousy. That jealousy becomes a, an admiration of the other person who has done something good or has some special beauty or wealth or power or glory. They don't feel that lust and greed. They feel like a delight in the bliss of others, etc., etc. So there's a sequence where you imagine that the mandala kind of takes over the universe and the whole thing becomes the mandala. And it's a very pleasant, actually. It's very pleasant. It's a, it's a real engine of creating internal heart's optimism, in fact, you could say. Okay? Yes, Banu? Banu? Banu is going to ask me about Shunyata. That's good. We still have a little time. You both have, both have time. Yeah, go on.
Uh, you were saying this uh, tank, tank tech, uh, practices were kept secret for a long time because the society was not ready. Do you believe there are other things that are kept secret that we don't, they are not? Uh, Nothing is secret. Tantra is already taught by Buddha in the Four Noble Truths. I, I, I very re rebelliously say. Tantra is taught in the Four Noble Truths. Because in the Third Noble Truth he says, Nirvana is the actual reality. Try to imagine it. Try to realize it. So that right there is teaching Tantra. Because everybody thinks they're in some really difficult world and it's really horrible. And the five guys he was talking to initially are like torturing themselves. They're so upset with the way the world is. So he's telling them, third noble truth, the, re the only real thing is Nirvana. Try to imagine it. Try to realize it, he says. That's it. He knows they have to try. It's not a truth for them because they're not yet noble beings. You know, they're all stuck in their own self-identity. So it's nothing secret. But socially, when I said secret, that's socially. Because socially, societies are, you know, people will misunderstand. And um, some societies are a certain way. And rulers could misunderstand. If you say this is all nirvana, they can say, well, I can kill everybody. I don't like it. It's still nirvana. Who cares? You know, they, they can go and be in another body and it'll be nirvana. In other words, anything, any human thing can be destroyed, messed up by ignorance, by ignorant humans, right? So certain very powerful things, like the unconscious, even that there is such a thing as the unconscious. That might be really bad for someone who wants to think I'm in control, I'm being a good person, and I'm nice, and God makes me nice, and that's great. And to think that that person is like, has the eros and thanatos in their unconscious, and they're basically the same as a serial killer. They could be with a different circumstance, or they could be some crazed libertine, you know. That wouldn't be good for them. It'd be nice for them to be a nice pater familias and not be too nasty in their family. So it, it has to build up. People have to get a certain way, you know. You, you, Buddha is a realist. Dalai Lama is a realist. Deals with the world as it is. And that's the encouraging thing. This Dalai Lama, if he really has the equal of the Buddha's compassion and insight, which I think he does, he says we're ready for world peace, actually. He doesn't say we still have to have World War Four and Five and Three and whatever. He doesn't say that. You know, the 13th Dalai Lama, he didn't say that. He, uh, during his big retreat, they had World War I, actually. And every empire in Eurasia collapsed during his three-year Yamantaka retreat. 1914, 1917 was his three-year retreat. <laughs> Putting out a little energy, I guess. Or, or, or maybe that was his way of dealing with the insane energy that was around in World War I. And what, what is the essence of the World War I? The, the supposedly most civilized, the flower of England, the flower of Germany, the flower of France, most civil, Austria, you know, the most civilized people. They sat in these trenches and they just blasted each other back and forth and slaughtered 35 million of them, which was a much bigger number in relation to the population at that time. That would be like a billion people today, in, in proportional to the population in 1914. 30 million or four, 30, 40 million. And they're back to get to five yards or ten yards, they would they lose like 10,000. Ridiculous. That they obeyed the orders of the stupid guy sitting in the back, Lord Toughbottom, sitting there having his, like, tea, sending them off. Why would they obey that? Crazy. You know, California hippies wouldn't obey that. They said, you shoot me just straight on, you know. I'm not going to go get shot by that uh, over there. Just you, you know. And that's where you shoot me straight. I'm not going to do it like that. Let me have my health drink and then shoot me. No problem. I'm not going out in the trench. Yes. Thank you. Um, I have a couple questions, uh, mostly practical. One is, uh, uh, could you please um, uh, explain clearly? Uh, it's difficult to find explanation of Svabhavika Kaya. And if you could shortly or... Svabhavikakaya, it's like a fourth body of Buddha. Uh, Nirmanakaya, Sambhogakaya, Svabhavakaya, and Svabhavikakaya. So if, if you could... I'm sorry, it's I'm... Like, it's like a fourth Buddha body. And uh, second question, it's like if you... <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't really understand the first question. <laughs> it's, 
Svabhavika Kaya. It's like a... Oh, oh Svabhavika Kaya, okay. Yeah, yeah. could yeah. you please explain it um, like a more simple way? Svabhavi, first question is about Svabhavika Kaya. Yeah, and second question... How do you translate that in English? Uh, it's uh, like a... a Th that I won't, because somebody say like pure purity, somebody say so different. I found different information. Swabhavika kaya, you could say nat nature body, natural nature, body. La, okay, nature, let's say we'll call it nature body. Then what's the second question? Nature entity body, yeah. And uh, second question about magical net. The what? Uh, the magical enlightened through magical net and first enlightenment in Kalashakra. Enli magical. Magical net. Land. Net. 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 <laughs> net or magical net or Maya yeah. Jala? Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> well, magical net is just like a hologram, basically. It's like Samantha Bhadra's thing in the Flower Ornament Sutra. But in the, particularly in the context of the Tantra, the Maya Jala Tantra, it, has, it connects to these Dakinis. You know, these uh, female Buddhas who are everywhere, actually, uh, like Samantabhadra, you know. And so it's, um, it's a vision that reality is embraced within the enlightened minds of a network of enlightened female Buddhas. It's really what magical net means. Like, for example, Maya Devi, the magical goddess, is the mother of, Shakyamuni, of Siddhartha, who becomes Shakyamuni Buddha. Right? And so that's in a sort of level where people are seeing sort of the individual and history coming and being ordinary and then being a Buddha. But Magical Net sees that Maya Devi is everywhere doing that. She's, she is the, she's the wisdom energy of the universe that is giving birth to all enlightened beings. Right? And the enlightenment in all beings. So that's sort of Maya job. Swabhavikakaya is in a way a similar thing. Swabhavikakaya means a body of nature. So it's just a way, analytically, of referring to a body of reality, dharmakaya. You know, that's when they split dharmakaya in two. They say body of nature, and then they call it intuition uh, reality body. So natural reality body and intuition reality body. Meaning, sort of, they make a subject-object out of what is beyond subject and object, just for, just for convenience, you know, just for fun. Just as a relativistic game. Neither of them, you know, really are, you know, are the absolute, you know. No verbal description of anything is the absolute, you know, it's just relative. So the nature body just means that reality, and that's the same, that's nirvana, that's the magical net, that's whatever it is. The sahaja kaya is more, fun, is the kalachakra one, sahaja, which people translate innate, which is not very smart, which actually means orgasmic body. That means where everything is made of the, the orgasmic bliss. Like even the wall is made of orgasmic bliss, the building, everything. Meaning that the clear light of bliss is a, is a melting bliss that everything is made of. Even though it seems to definitely not be melting, and please don't melt and have the third floor fall down on my head. But in this relative moment, this, I'm not capable of withstanding that. But. Um, those are just ways of conveying the inconceivability of reality, which is nirvana. Okay? So Bhavi Kakaya is right here. It's all yours. <laughs> what, what, what is your nationality? Are you Russian? No, you what? Ukrainian. Ukrainian. Aha. Ukrainians are not Russians. What do you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. You know, the Tibetan movement loves that fact. Because actually, for 200 years, at least, the Tsars, back in, from the Tsars period, Russians have been trying to convince the Ukrainians that they are Russian, because the Russians have always been wanting to go to the beach. <laughs> and the Ukrainians have all the beach, so far, it used to, except for some little dinky Sochi place. You know. So now they have Crimea, they're all happy, you know. You know. So, so there's beaches there, you know, some of the year. <laughs> I know, very nice. So, 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 so that's, don't, don't worry about all these things. Everybody gets all very mysterious, they're just elaborations of the mind that are useful to open the imagination to the one most inconceivable fact, which is that, you know, Ray Charles, do you know who Ray Charles is? 
He's a musician, a black musician. He was blind, you know, uh, like uh, like TV Wonder, but he passed away a lot some time back. But he has it's, it's All Right. What is that name of that song? What is it? It's All Right. He has a song like It's All Right. Right? It's All Right. Something like that. You know the tune? Oh, he's going to play it. <laughs> you know, it means that the default the reality is bliss. That's the default position of life, is bliss. We make these horrible unrealities ourselves by being stupid and selfish and aggressive and whatever. But, but the, the relaxing thing is that if all, all in all reality is good, that's what, that's what the Buddha discovered. That's why Buddhism has been considered useful by every kind of people who have encountered it. And some take it as a religion, but really it wasn't meant to be a religion. It was, it, it, it was created by these higher beings who became higher by understanding that. They became sort of free because they understood that no matter what happens, it's all fine. And so they didn't have to fight over this or that or defend that the other, you know. And that giving is the way of, giving everything away all the time is the way of falling back into that real reality. You know, generosity and patience and happiness is the right method of finding it, you know. That's, that's what they found. And he was rebelling against the Vedist religion very strongly, which is where they were sacrificing animals and all kinds of things to some gods who were kind of grumpy and they were frightened, frightened of them. You know, the Vedic people were. So, so that's Svabhavikakaya means that. It means that it's completely natural. That nature itself is made of bliss, you know. The medicine Buddha vision is that everything in nature is healing. It's meant to heal us if we're open to it. And, but we have to understand, even the deadliest poison can be healing. If, you know, a tiny micro homeopathic trace, a molecular trace of it, if we know how to do that, it can be healing if we understand it, right? So don't, don't be frightened. Don't be scared of the Russians. <laughs> they just want to go to the beach. If they, they will become Ukrainian if they have to, to go to the beach, <laughs> which I applaud them, you know. And all these fake things that people don't, you know, that there are certain people who don't want to have fun, like that theory of Lee Kuan Yew. Oh no, Chinese people don't want democracy. Oh, Chinese people, they love to work in factories. They like to make Apple, Apple iPhones for weird white people. Oh, they love that. They don't, they're happy to work 17 hours a day. That's why we're doing so great. And this is weird confusion. And that means we don't need fun. That's total BS. When Confucius was asked, in the, if they had ever read the Confucian Analects, he was asked, how would you most like to spend your time, Mr. Confucius? Mr. Kung Fu Tzu, how would you like to spend your time? Oh, he said, if I had my wishes, I would have a bottle of wine, and it would be springtime, and I'd go to a bend in the river where we have the earth altars, and some boys and girls would come with feathered addresses of the ancient tradition, with flutes and musicians, and lutes and flutes, and they would dance and sing while I drank my wine by the riverside. That's what I want. He didn't say, I want to make iPhones <laughs> or build skyscrapers or do that. He didn't say that. He didn't say, I want to be power over the world. He didn't say, I want power over the whole world. I want to be superpower. He didn't say that. He said, I wanted to go and sit by the river and listen to the flutes and have a nice time. Every human being is like that. There's no one that's different. Just there are different levels of ignorant cultures, right? What do you think, Laura? No, just... What? Hmm? What? You have Ray Charles there? No. You couldn't find Ray Charles? Oh, no. Oh. No. I don't know. I decided I need a little I see. OK, well, listen, goodbye, everybody. It is 9 o'clock. Oh, yes, William, what, what do you want to say, William? I have a question about the Kala Chakra Mandala. About the Kala Chakra Mandala, yes? It's, it's full of seed syllables. Full of what? Seed syllables. Yeah. What is a seed syllable? And does it have, is it, are they just ID tags for 722 deities? Or do they have a larger significance? And especially the syllable that 
That's a very good question. Especially and let me, the multiple yeah, because, syllable that stands for the Because time is short. Let me try to answer it briefly. In the Sanskrit universe, they take seriously this idea that the word is powerful. And because, because everything is relative. And that means that the universe is shaped by the intersecting mind fields of beings. And what, what shapes the intersecting mind fields of beings, like Buddha says in the Vimalakirti Sutra, he calls it intersecting fields of mind field of beings. What shapes that is the language, the words of the beings. And, and, the, and the, the poetic heart, creative poetic heart and language are the syllables. Uh, that are form language. And so a lot of those seed syllables are the first name, the letter, first letter of the name of the deities that the seed syllable represents with a m mm sound, you know, like pam would be pandara vasini, you know, vam would be, you know, vajradara or something, you know, this kind of thing. And so, so the idea is that the being evolves, shapes into an embodiment, into a seemingly separate entity out of the clear light of the vast, infinite energy of that by the movement of language. And actually, that's a Brahminical. That, that is the wisdom of India. India did have these really brilliant people. They had this most wealthy, uh, richer than China nature they had there with all those river valleys, more than Mesopotamia or Nile or anywhere. And so they tolerated more intelligence and more education and more insight. So they really, the Sanskrit language is something really amazing. And, uh, and that, that works with those seed syllables. So they even had an idea that the Big Bang was, uh, was a linguistic conspiracy <laughs> rather than just some sort of explosive matter thing, you know, some atoms exploding, you know. And so if you go down to the wave particle, you know, paradox, you know, how do you solve the wave particle paradox, you know, where something is either a particle or a wave, meaning that it's everywhere. Wave means it's like all over the place. And which is where the materialists have landed and they can't make a heads or tails of it, actually, really. But the way that those waves are shaped is by language. So they have this thing where in the Guya Samaja they have a famous verse where it says, your body is shaped by your mind, but your mind is shaped by your language, by your word by your speech. So in a way, speech is the most powerful because speech is where is sort of a collective mind. It's, where, it's what shapes the collective mind, the group mind, the mass mind, you could say. It's shaped by speech. Okay? So that's what seed syllable is. And you, you do that when you visualize. And the hung letter, for example, or the om letter is, you know, is uh, the om syllable. Those are really, the, those are the body and the mind of Buddha, and the ah is the speech of Buddha. Ah is the speech of Buddha. Om ah hong. That's why that, that's such a primal thing, om ah hong. When you say om ah hong, you're, you're imagining that, uh, you're imagining what you don't know, but is what is actually the reality, they say, and you will know, which is that the body, speech, and mind of all Buddhas is infinitely present everywhere. So om ah hong is celebrating the infinite presence of all Buddhas right now, right here. In every atom, every subatomic particle. Thank goodness. They didn't take off. They didn't leave us. They didn't leave us to Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah, but they somehow, he, he's there, sorry. He's somehow there, I don't know how. Because he, he, did the, he did what's called the white hype strategy, successfully, with the Republican thing. And the political scientists have something called the white hype strategy that is valid for 2016, but won't work in 2020. So it's their last gasp of the white fascists. So we have to resist it, and we will. Okay, bye. Take care, everybody. This video was brought to you in part with the generous support of the Tibet House U.S. membership community. To learn more about the benefits of Tibet House membership, please visit Tibet House US, including invites to special trips to study Buddhism up close and personal with Robert Thurman during his annual geographic expedition trips. Trips in 2018 include Mongolia and Bhutan. To learn more, visit BobThurman.com.